have a Cliff Gager here, and Cliff has been doing real estate for many, many years. He's been a mentor for the top, top of all the companies out there. He's worked for, I think, Fan Merrill and other people. All of them. He's not only very experienced and does what he does very well, you're going to find him very entertaining, too. Oh, uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cliff. Thank you. Okay. All right, guys, you guys ready? Who wants to learn? Who's seen me speak before? On YouTube. On YouTube. Yeah, he's like, hey, are you on YouTube? I'm like, was it, a, was it a, like a car chase no, thing? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but who's, who, um, who wants to learn how to do real estate the easy way? Okay. Who, uh, I'm going to ask a couple questions. Who's already doing real estate? Who's done more than five deals this week? Oh, come on, you got to keep your hands up. <laughs> All right, well, my name is Cliff Gager. Jake is my partner back there. Uh, we do a, a, the Real Estate Expert Online radio show. In fact, that's why uh, we were kind of a little bit late getting here, but we actually weren't. But uh, we do it, uh, we record it live, if that makes any sense, uh, every Saturday from uh, noon until 1 o'clock. But then they upload it to the satellite, and it gets played all over the United States in different time zones and and, and it's, it's one of those things that we've been doing the show, what now, uh, eight weeks? Eight weeks no, or so? It started a week ago, wasn't it? Uh, no, it was not a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's weird because you have to talk almost like you're in a vacuum of time because you can't say, hey, it's a wonderful Saturday out there because it's this deep in snow on Sunday in Chicago when it's playing. Right. So it's, it's kind of weird that you get into this little zone there. But... Uh, We've been doing it now for um, about eight or nine weeks, and we're just starting to get into the groove, and we're, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So if you get to, uh, uh, you can go to iHeartRadio. Anybody have iHeartRadio? You can go on there and just search Cliff Gager Real Estate or the uh, Real Estate Expert Online Radio Show, and you can listen to our show. It's, it's podcast on there, so you can listen to all of them. Um, anybody uh, listen to the radio? <laughs> There's still people that listen to the radio, see? Uh, but mostly all podcasts now, right? No. No? No podcasts? Yes. Oh, you listen to podcasts. Not much radio. All of it. All of it. All of it. All of it. So, uh, anybody do real estate investing outside of Santa Barbara? Okay, everybody. Outside of the state of California. Interesting. Great. All right. So I'm going to give you guys some uh, really cool things to use today. Um, oh, oh, I didn't recognize how many how many people have seen me present before or seen my presentations. Okay. Cool. So I'm going to give you some really cool things. I've been doing this for <laughs> Jake and I were talking about it today since uh, late 1991. I started in the mortgage business. Uh, I ended up uh, working through that. I ended up being an investor. Uh, and funding a lot of the, I did a hard, I was a hard money lender, so I, I came from the finance side of the world, but I was also in construction before I came into here, so I knew how to do the repairs and everything. And one day I was uh, doing funding for uh, one of my investors before I actually got involved in it, and uh, I'm sitting there looking at the closing statement. You got, who, who does not know what a closing statement is? All right, who knows what the most important thing to look at on the closing statement is cash to seller, seller. right? <laughs> Amen. Right. So I'm sitting there, and as a mortgage guy, I did the hard money loan on this guy's house, so I helped him get it. Um, uh, I helped him do the funding and the financing for the whole thing, plus the repairs, because I gave them everything. I, I, well, I was at 65% LTV, so if I gave you the money to do the repairs and everything, and you got it all done, and then you failed, yay me, right? Do you get that? But it was ARV, 65%. Correct. Okay. Yes, correct. Well, no, 65% of uh, purchase price. Oh, okay. So, so they, they had, had skin in the so game. They had skin in the game. Yeah. Uh, and if they didn't, I'd loan them the money to do it. <laughs> 18 and 10, 18% and 10 points. So uh, that was the name of my boat. <laughs> nobody, nobody, no, nobody got it. Yeah. <laughs> a boat is a big hole you pour uh, in the water that you pour money into. But. Um, what happened was, is I'm sitting there this one day at the closing table, and I was in charge because I was doing the financing for the buyer that was taking out the investor. Do you, you guys got me? Mm -hmm. You with me? 
guys are kind of like, you wait? <laughs> so what happened is I'm looking at the closing statement because as the mortgage lender for the borrower, it's my job to make sure all the numbers are right and everybody's getting paid, who's getting paid, how much they're getting paid. I know all these things because I orchestrated it. And I'm sitting there after about two or 300 closings for these other investors and I look at the statement and it says cash to seller, net to seller was like 25,000 bucks. And, and I says, it's 25,000 bucks. And my commissions are all right. And I made a lot of money back then because there was no such thing as truth in lending. But that's a whole nother, that's a whole, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother story. But uh, I, 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 I personally think I was the responsibility of that law. <laughs> Now, mortgage brokers, we used to make, like, uh, so if anybody doesn't know, truth in lending means I have to tell you how much I'm making as your mortgage broker. Uh, back then, you didn't have to. So if I wrote you at 9% and the rates were 7% and the lender gave me 8 points for writing the higher interest rate, I never had to tell you. But now you have to. So, of course, the savviness of your client would be like, what? I'm not going to let you make that much money. I'll go somewhere else where they'll do it cheaper. But um, I'm looking at the statement. All the numbers are right. And that $25,000 to the seller. And the, the buyer was sitting here. The seller was sitting here. The title clerk was over there. And I was here. And I was like, everything's great. We went through the closing. But it really stuck into my mind that I, I, I could have done the same thing. I could have done what they were doing. I investigated the property as a hard money lender to know whether it was a viable investment or not for him to do the acquisition on it. I knew what it needed in repairs because I came, I, one of my first jobs I started in construction, so I knew how to do that. Plus I used to watch Bob Vila on TV all the time. There's my age again. Bob Vila is this old guy, <laughs> if you don't know, who used to do the Saturday morning show on how to fix your house. And, and as I'm going through all of this, I'm realizing that I could have done that. I could have done that deal. Yes, sir? But wouldn't, weren't you making more money as a lender with the points and issues? I could have done that and right. made 25 grand. What was it worth? Yes, because from that realization, uh, I, I was just a mortgage broker at that point in time. And I was making about literally 10 points per loan. So $100,000 mortgage, I'm making $10,000. I was doing the hard money loan, so I made like 80,000, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I made like maybe four or $5,000 on the acquisition loan. So that plus that $25,000, oh, the seller was paying me $3,500 to sell the house for because that's what I was doing. I was doing everything. All he did was show up at the closing to buy it, then he had all the guys do the repairs, and then he showed up at the closing when he sold it, and I handled the aspect from there. So I, I had this realization, oh my God, I can do that. You know what I was doing wrong? I was sitting in the wrong chair. I should have been sitting in the seller's chair. Because I did almost everything except swing the hammer. But he didn't swing the hammer either, right? But he coordinated the whole time. Right. But I could have done that because I, you know, I stayed at a Holiday Inn one time. <laughs> right? You know that commercial? <laughs> so I did. I went and I bought my first house. I, I went to the bank that I knew he was buying the foreclosures from. Um, and I says, hey, I'd like to you know, see if I could buy a couple of these things too. He's like, oh my God, I was wondering when you were going to wake up and come and see me. And I'm like, you're such a great salesman. I was wondering why you didn't come and ask me to come see you. You know, but they're not. They're not going to do that. But the cool thing is, I bought my first house. Now, anybody know what, anybody in sales? Commissionable sales. You know, okay, so nobody, nobody in the room. Commissionable sales, you're always broke, but you got a lot of money coming. Right? <laughs> Because, you know, it takes 30, 60, 90 days to get to closing, right? So you make $10,000 here, but you don't get it for 30, 60, 90 days, right? And sometimes the closing doesn't happen, right? So what happens is I have all this money coming from doing these mortgages, but it's down the road on the calendar. It's called your pipeline. And, and what they do is you, you actually have a calendar. Well, this is before, you know, Windows 95 wasn't even out yet. So we had a whiteboard. And on it, it showed all my closings and when the money was coming in. And that's how you paid your bills or you did your, your life revolved around your 
upcoming closings. So even though I was making, you know, like $40,000 this month, I was broke today because I didn't have any money because you spend that $40,000 that's coming next month, last month, so you're always like a month behind. Anybody ever realize that or <laughs> envision uh, having that problem? So what happens is I put an offer on this house. I went and looked at it. It was a rectangle. And when you looked in the front door, you could see right out the sliding glass doors. And the guy built a addition on the slab that had no foundation. And then in the corner, he built this rock fireplace, right? Big rock fireplace. It's in Florida. The, sand, the, the substrate is sand, <laughs> right? You dig six inches in Florida, you're hitting water, OK? So what happened was is the slab cracked. So as you walk in the front door, you see this cracked slab, and the whole roof is pulling away from the building. And uh, you can see sunlight shining down like angels singing on the crack, right? <laughs> so 90% of the people walked in and walked right back out. Well, I walked in, and I looked at that, and I calculated what the value, and I'm going to teach you how to do this today. I calculated the value of the house. I knew what it was worth per square foot, and I figured out how many square foot that room was, as to fix it or what? Remove it. Remove it. And the value was in removing it, not repairing it. Because it was going to cost like eight, I don't remember the exact numbers, $8,000 to fix it, and it was worth $6,000 in value. So it was $450 to throw it in a dumpster and haul it away. So what makes more sense, right? So I put this $40,000 all cash offer thinking it's a $120,000 house. They'll never take it, because I didn't have the money, right? <laughs> and guess what they did? They took it. So I had 30 days to close, and I had money in 45 days. So I, I, I couldn't say, well, can we extend it? Because they're not going to do that, right? Anybody buy a house? OK? You, it's hard to get extensions on time without losing it. So long story short, I didn't know what to do. I went to the title company and I says, I don't know what to do. And she says, well, why don't you just sell it to one of your investors? And I'm like, oh, why didn't I think of that? And uh, I, I'm like, well, how do I do that? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I knew how to do it, but I didn't know how the mechanics of doing that. So she says, it's real simple. We'll do a back to back simultaneous double closing. Right, because you could do that back then. It was real simple and easy. So what happened was, is I went to my investor. And I says, "Hey, if you find a house that's worth one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and you subtract the repairs and the costs and the holding costs and my all my fees, you know, because I'm so horrible on my fees, and you make that profit, do you care if I bought it for a little less and I sell it to you for that?" And he says, "No, that's what we do for a living." And I said, so you don't care how much money I make? He says, dude, I want you to make money. If you're making money, that's helping me because everybody's going to be happy. Right? Everybody want to be happy? Right? Anybody want a little extra money? Do you want to take the money away from me because I'm making too much money? No. If you think that way, get out of this business right now. Seriously. Especially when I, I say it's 18 and 10. Because <laughs> I'm going to make my money. So I sold it to him for sixty-five thousand. What was my contract price? Forty. So we walk into the title company, and, and it really didn't happen this way, but this is really how it happened. I walked into the first room because the guy that was buying it from me deposited sixty-five thousand dollars in escrow. Forty of it was what? Non-refundable. So if he walked out of there and said, "I'm not buying this house," he walked out with what? 65 grand? Yeah. No. 20, 25,000 bucks. That 40 was non refundable, meaning I had control of that money, even though it was in the title company's control. You get it? Mm -hmm. So when I walked into that room with the bank, signed the papers, la la la, the bank slides the keys over to me, the title company slides the $40,000 check over to them. I come out of that room, go into this other room, and we do the whole thing again. I slide the keys to the buyer, which was the other investor. And the title company slid the check over to me. And I walked out of there with 24 grand. Because it cost me a grand to close that, which I didn't complain at all. And I went to the bank and cashed it. 
I cashed a check. Did you know that banks don't have $24,000 in them? <laughs> and, and then the worst thing, you know who they call when they give you that money? The IRS. They literally call them. Said, oh, Cliff Gager, social security number, blah, 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 and the address of this, just cashed a cash money check for 24,000 bucks. Because, you know, you have a partner. They only show up on what? Your payday, not when you have to pay. Anyways, you know, that whole thing. Don't get me started on that. So, I walked out of there with $24,000, and I thought the world had just completely changed, and it really did, because after that deal, I bought 248 houses in three and a half years. I bought them, I fixed them, I sold them, because I thought, oh, I'm gonna make the big bucks instead of the 24, I could have made another 24,000. Oh, I sold that house for him, did the mortgage on it for his buyers. So I made money on that as well. And like I said, I did 248 houses in three and a half years. I opened a mortgage company, I opened up a, my own real estate office. I am not a licensed uh, real estate agent, never have been, never will be. Any, any real estate agents? One, liability. I, I have none to deal with with, the, with a license. So I can say things that you can't. And I can do things that you can't. That's true, but I can hire you to do them for me. <laughs> and I can hire, hire myself. Amen, amen. So what happens is, is I did. I hired a broker, and I opened up my own real estate office. And if you walked into my office, I either sold you my house or somebody else's house, and I did the mortgage for you, whether you bought my house or somebody else's, or if you didn't do real estate transaction with us, I'd do the mortgage for you. And if you already had a mortgage and you came in and did a real estate transaction, I'd handle your real estate transaction. The only thing that I didn't do was open up a title company, which I was working on when the divorce started. And I'm not gonna go there because, you know, I thought it was, I was like the only person that has ever gone through a divorce. You know, and it was a big deal. I mean, $10 million later, you know. Um, and then my partner, Jake, he's, he's in law, and he says, you know, divorce rate is about 50%. Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> oh, well, it wouldn't have been so bad, but you were spending two hours of your... No, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> you had slides. <laughs> <laughs> not really. No, no, I didn't. So what happened was um, I did. I, I went to Mexico. I have pictures of me with beer bottles around me. <laughs> Because I went to Mexico and drank. Anybody lose $10 million in a divorce settlement? Okay, you drink. That's the only solution after that. Uh, and I did it in uh, Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Do not wear nice shoes in Mexico. And if the police or policia says, hey, nice shoes, you give them to him. Or he gives you a nod on the head and you have to pay $5,000 to get out of jail. Which I don't know anything about that. So, but, but basically what happened was uh, uh, I ended up getting in the seminar business. I start working for all the names that you can think of. And what I do, uh, or what I did for them was they come through, they do the free event, they then they have the workshop, they sell you a $50,000 product. I'm the guy that would show up and teach the $50,000 product. And I made a lot of money with them, a whole lot. But I have a conscience, <laughs> and uh, I didn't see it, because you know, in the beginning with the way the in internet was, you didn't really see a lot of the results or in the wake. Do you know what a wake is? Like you're on a boat and you see that wake of, of dead bodies behind you, <laughs> you know? And I didn't see that in the beginning, but as time went along, I start seeing that they weren't as, as uh, well, how can I say? See, I have to say this in a legal manner of I just wanted to see better results from the people that were taking the training. And that wasn't happening. So when I went to suggest more things, it never worked out that way. Do you, you guys understand? Anybody have a job and you, you know you can make the job better and you bring it to the attention of management and they just stifle you because they don't want it to be better, right? Because it's working. Does that make sense? So I'll just leave it at that. So that's when I started doing my own thing. And the reason I started doing my own thing is because I get to help people. The biggest benefit to doing what I do is helping other people do what I did. I dropped out of school in ninth grade. I literally quit school when I was 16 years old in ninth grade. I was in the dean's office and they had this big counter here. 
And what happened was, is I wasn't skipping school. I was going to the two classes that I wanted to go to, which was architectural drafting and mechanical drafting, and instead of art and home economics. So I skipped those classes, and I went to the, the classes that I wanted to. So what, it, what, what happened was, is they saw me skipping those classes. They called me in the office for that, and I'm like, but I'm over here. I'm like acing these two classes, and they're like, you can't do that. And I said, but I already did. And, and they, 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 it took them that long to figure out, and they says, well, you can't do that. And I don't know how I knew at 16 years old you didn't have to go to school anymore, but I literally looked at her and I says, you know what, I'm six, I was a little cocky back then, That's a little bit more than I am now, but I says, you know, I don't have to be here. And I quit, and I turned around like this and my mom was right here. <laughs> Now this is back in the day, right, where your mom would help you out to the car. <laughs> and in fact, there was some guy over there and he helped too. <laughs> Doesn't happen that way anymore, now they just bring out the cameras. So what happened was, is I went and uh, I took my GED and I got into construction and, and I worked for a Lithuanian guy who did everything by hand. I poured like a 25 by 15 four inch deep concrete thing mixing the concrete in a trough. So I know how to do that. <laughs> so when, uh, when I got into the seminar business and I started doing this and I saw that I could get better results, I started coming to these meetings like this and presenting directly to you so that you can take advantage of my experience. So do you know what a personal financial revolution is? That's the, that's the morning you wake up and you say, oh my God, I can make that too, <coughs> right? I had a, a realization, and it was revolutionary, because I, being a, a person that would go to work, you know, in order to get rich, you had to work for somebody for a long time and work your way up the ladder and hopefully get into management someday and maybe take over the company. How many people actually do that? Just the guys you see on TV, right? Uh, well, you did, yeah. Not many, right? So my personal re financial revolution was when I looked at that closing statement and I thought, oh my God, I can do that. And you can, and I did. So who else wants one of those? Do you, anybody in here want one of those? A little bit? All right, so let's go. I'm gonna teach you a couple of things. And I've, I've got uh, a lot of time to teach you some really cool uh, strategies that work that uh, I've developed over the years and have really created a way of doing them in a way that nobody else can do. And it involves a lot of psychology and it involves a lot, I'm playing with the camera. <laughs> uh, it involves a lot of psychology and the people that you're working with have no clue what you're doing. Isn't that cool? Um, well, there's, there's a few ladies in here, but guys, your wife asks you a question. Does these pants make, there's no right answer, right? But she knows exactly what she's doing, and, and here we are. No, honey, your, your butt looks the normal size, right? So what happens is, is then, you, then you're living in the doghouse, right? Because she sets you up, and you didn't even see it coming. So that's what I'm going to do with real estate. But one of the most important things I, I want to talk about because I help a lot of people, 99% of the time when people get in trouble, it's because they don't understand the structure of a deal. Um, who has not bought a piece of property as an investment property in the room? Okay. <clears throat> when you buy a house and you structure it, when you're making the offer and you're making the purchase, you have to know what. What is it going to sell for? What are the repairs going to be? You know. What makes a deal a deal? You have to know all of the aspects of the transaction going all the way through in order to do what? Make the offer, right? So what happens is a lot of people come to me and they say, oh my God, Cliff, I bought this house and we're going to closing and the appraisal came in $20,000 low and my, my repair budget was $30,000 too high. And I have to come to closing with $40,000. Help me. It's too late. So... It's like my duty to come out and tell everybody how not to get into that position. Would that be fair to teach you that today? Yeah? yeah? Okay. So, what makes a deal? Um, is it the repairs? Is it the location? Is it 
What, what do you, th uh, let's go around the room, what do you think makes a deal? Uh, it's got to be, let's say, 70 cents in the dollar, 80 cents in the dollar, it's, uh, with uh, minus the repairs. Okay. And uh, got, there's got to be some leeway there for to make a profit. Wiggle room. Yeah. Okay. What do you think? Purchase price. Purchase price is the deal. What do you think? Purchase price. Purchase price? Purchase price? 50 to 60 percent of ARV on purchase. Okay. What do you think? Purchase price. Purchase price? Purchase price. What do you think? No idea. No idea? That's great. Plug it in my spreadsheet and see. Oh, there you go. What do you think? Uh, everyone walks away with a little bit of something. And it has to happen, right? What do you think? Location for sure help. Location? Location? Yeah, what do you think? The right numbers. The right numbers? Relative purchase price for location. Relative purchase price. The only thing that, oh, Linda's back there. Go ahead, Linda. Hey, Linda's here. Hey, Linda. Terms. Terms. You're all correct. But the most important thing is you make money when you buy. You realize profits when you sell. So if you are going to sell and you didn't buy it right, you're screwed. Okay? And what everybody says to me is, but the realtor told me it was going to be a good deal 99% of the time. And I says, well, well, then have the realtor bring the $30,000 you're short out of her pocket to make up for the deal. And they said, no, that's not going to happen, right? Because the realtor is not what? In your deal. Okay, they might be getting a commission and I have nothing against realtors. They're doing their job. But you don't take their advice because it says on the contract, don't take our advice. Get professionals to tell you what the value is, what the repairs are going to be, right? It says it right on the contract. So follow the instructions on the contract. Make sure you know. Um, one of the things that I find is uh, the cost of repairs don't reflect an increase in the sales price. So I watch these, anybody watch those shows on TV where they're flipping houses and stuff? All right, and they say, uh, they show you the, the, the old kitchen and then they show you the new kitchen and they say we increased or we, we put $20,000 into the kitchen and increased the value $100,000 or $40,000 or $60,000. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Formica equals tile equals style stone equals granite or whatever else you want to make those countertops out of. It's a countertop. If you put gold in there, it's still a countertop. Now somebody might buy it and say, well, I can rehab this and yank that out and sell it at the pawn shop, but I'm, I'm trying to make you understand it doesn't matter. Like gold toilet bowls. If you put gold toilet bowls or, in, or, or you put in uh, um, uh, what, what, uh, a Viking stove into a $40,000 house that doesn't make the house worth $50,000. You see what I'm saying? Because it's a stove. So don't ever fall into that trap. Um, <clears throat> the increase of a sales price can only be increased by adding square footage. Okay? If you add a pool, it's going to cost you $30,000 to add a pool, and they're going to give you about eight to $10,000 on an appraisal for a pool. So you're not going to increase the value. So stay within the value that's there. So the thing that I want to pass on to you is the fact that if you buy a house, um, don't try to make it more than it is. Does that does it make sense? So now, if you're buying in Chicago, uh, I, I've done a bunch of houses in Chicago, and when you buy the house in Chicago, you have a three-bedroom, one-bath house with a basement, okay? And everybody now is ripping off the whole top floor and creating three or four bedrooms upstairs and then living space on the, the, bottom, you know, the bottom floor, and then they're, they're doing the, the basement all up. And what I found is, is it costs... You know, you're, in, you're, you're out of pocket about a half a million dollars per house, and then when you sell it, you're selling it for 600 grand. So you're making $100,000 profit. And what I did was, the smartest thing I thought was, I took the basement and converted the basement by digging down three feet, you know, digging out the concrete, 
you dig down three feet, you put a new footer foundation around it, and that gives you your height for your basement because otherwise you're walking around like this. And uh, you put your bedrooms down there, and it costs, uh, you had maybe $400,000 out of pocket into the property, but you were still selling it for 600 grand. So what made more sense? You know, oh, and you can work in the basement in wintertime. You can't work on the roof in the wintertime in Chicago. When it's 10 degrees.